What do you have if a scribe and a Pharisee are buried up to their necks in cement? <laughs> Not enough cement. <coughs> it's a shame how 99% of the scribes and Pharisees give their professions a bad name. <coughs> it was so cold one February, I saw a Pharisee put his hands in his own pocket. <coughs> okay. Maybe I'm being too hard on the scribes and Pharisees. So what if they think all the rest of us, spiritually, are unclean pigs? Ew! Don't get any on us. What we want to know is what Jesus thinks. What Jesus thinks about them and about us, unclean pigs. All of the Gospels are filled with many instances where Jesus interacts with the scribes and Pharisees, clearly revealing what he thinks about them. We have time to take a look at one of these. One of these found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We'll focus mostly on verses 11 through 32 of that chapter, the story of the prodigal son. However, we can't just jump in at the end. We must look at the context of the prodigal son. Otherwise, we won't be able to see how this familiar story relates to what Jesus thinks about the scribes and Pharisees. I'm willing to bet you never knew that it did relate to them. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, him being the incarnate Christ. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scribes, muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. If a scribe and a Pharisee were both drowning and you could save only one of them, would you go to lunch? or read the paper. <coughs> Jesus defends his welcoming and eating with tax collectors and sinners by answering their biting criticism with three parables. Three parables involving something of value that was lost, then found, resulting in rejoicing, not muttering and grumbling. First, the parable of the lost sheep. Suppose one of you one of you Pharisees or scribes, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. 2. The parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my one lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, parable three, the parable of the lost son. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him 
and released the hounds to scare them away. No. Locked the gates, closed the blinds, turned out the lights, and pretended to not be home. No. Sicked Sven, Rothgar, Gunther on him to drive him away. Nah. Acted like a scribe and Pharisee and did not welcome him nor eat with him. No, not that either. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, ran up to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Uh, The older brother didn't like any of this and became angry. He didn't want to celebrate. So he said to his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So as we asked up front, are we being too hard on the scribes and Pharisees? Even if they think all the rest of us spiritually are unclean pigs, no way would they get near us, welcome us, nor eat with us. Plus, what do they have to say that we'd want to hear? It's not like they speak for God. It's not like they speak in the name of the Lord. But I digress. What we want to know is what does Jesus think about them, about them scribes and Pharisees, and about them sinners. Focusing on the prodigal son in a context where Jesus is using three parables about something of value that was lost, then found, resulting in rejoicing as his response to their muttering about his welcoming and eating with sinners. Sinners who had gathered close enough around him in order to hear what he had to say. What does Jesus think about them scribes and Pharisees? He thinks that they don't understand, that they don't have a clue about the fundamental concept of proximity proximity to that which has value to God. Proximity when it comes to seeking and finding that which is spiritually lost and dead. Sinners. What's the difference between a shame and a pity? If a busload of scribes and Pharisees goes over a cliff and there are no survivors, that's known as a pity. But if there were any empty seats, now that's a shame. (laughs) 